everyone, you're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Anna Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT therapist and supervisor here in fabulous Las Vegas. We're welcoming back to our show, Debbie Semeca Diaz. She is one of our beloved trainers from the EFT Center in New Jersey. And she's been so gracious to be on our show quite a few times. And we've had some really great talks before, so I hope that you guys are tuning in and you're excited to have her back on because we are talking today about getting stuck in content in EFT. So thank you, Debbie, for being back on our show. We really appreciate you. So, you know, let's talk about, you know, what is kind of the EFT view of content and is content ever like important? Does it ever matter? Yeah, those are um, really good questions. And I would say, first, I want to say, I love that you do this for therapists um, because it's such a huge resource for them to have free access to EFT information. And that's why I'm willing to kind of come on here and do this because I want people to really get this model and learn EFT. So thank you so much for doing this. I think it's awesome. So content, I, so we talk about a lot in EFT, focus on process, we're process consultants, we don't want to get caught in content, all of that is true, and I would say, um, if I had to put a number on that, 75% of the time, we want the content to just kind of go by where we're not grabbing it. Um, maybe 20 to 25% of the time, the content becomes really important. Um, and I think that the content becomes important when we're talking about specific injuries. The content becomes important when you're trying to reflect someone's emotional experience and they keep going back to the content and they can't just go with the process. Um, so what I've learned, my experience of doing EFT, taping, watching my tapes is that when I'm reflecting only process or emotional experience and the person's going back to the content, if I then take the very, very small piece of content and link it to my reflection of emotions and emotional experience, they then go with me. So I, I, it's hard to say like when we need to do that. I would lean towards trying to reflect process most of the time unless you bump up against that. I mean, I remember a guy, um, who was, um, he kept talking about how the house was not kept, like that was just messy. Every day he walked in from work and it was just messy. And he ended up feeling not cared for because he kept saying this to his wife and she wouldn't do anything about it. So I would reflect the not feeling cared for and try to open up his emotional world around that. And he kept going back to the house being messy. And I was, so I kept hitting that block a little bit. So then I, reflect the house being messy, link it really strongly with the not feeling cared for, and he drops into the emotion. And all it was for me to say that one phrase with it. So, and this was a really long time ago, but I'll always remember that guy. Like I, or I can see him in my mind right now because he taught me something really important about content, that there's times that we need to link it. Right, so when clients get really stuck on content, sometimes that's an indication that there's something about that particular content that's really important to the client, and they're really kind of digging in, wanting to be heard around that, so you're saying it's important to link it, and I've had this happen where, you know, I try to reflect the process, and they're not really buying into the process. They keep saying, no, it's about this thing. It's about this thing, so when they keep going back to it's about this thing, how do you sort of uh marry that into how would you respond to a client or what kind of verbiage would you use to marry that into the process so i think one of the things that we need to do as eft therapists is agree with our client always first like there's this way of kind of starting out our interventions with yes and or of course or i hear you and that's important and then we can add like our piece I feel like a lot of times we try to add our piece without agreeing with the client and then they put, they put a stake in the ground that says, you must listen to my content story. And, they, and, then, they, and then there gets up tension between therapist and client. So I think that it's important for us in the beginning of EFT to lay a foundation and be clear about the model. Like I feel like the clearer we are about what this therapy looks like to our clients, 
And the more focused we are in the beginning and guiding them on what's important, the, the easier, if you will, the therapy becomes because the client then knows what matters. So I think about it when it comes to content. If you let your clients just talk about content, especially in those first few sessions, because you're trying to kind of just listen and hear their story, those first few sessions are really important in developing a foundation. And if they get used to talking in content and then you try to kind of shift them on after your assessment, after your X amount of assessment sessions, you'll hit more of a block because they think now after four or five sessions or whatever the number is, that they're going to come in and to be telling stories as part of therapy. So I feel like we need to be clear about this is what EFT looks like. This is the way that I work. And you might find that I might interrupt you as we go or redirect because I really want to try to understand how you guys impact each other. That's going to be our first thing that we're going to be looking at here. So just by being clear about that, I do think that that helps the couples. And couples, they, this is going to sound silly, but they don't know how to be good EFT clients. We help them become good EFT clients. That's totally true. And, so, and you also just sort of highlighted two really important things. So. I hear you say that on one end, you know, it's important to let the clients understand the model and how it works. And I think one of the segues I've used is if they keep trying to pull you back to that content is like, well, we're going to talk about how you guys get stuck when such and such comes up and you guys aren't able to, you know, when you reach an impasse and can't reconcile this together and become disconnected. So, you know, when they keep pulling you back, and I love how you said, you know, sort of allow them to feel really heard as part of building, building that rapport, building that alliance in the first session or so. But it, one of the other things you said was really important about, I think the other way that we can get caught in content is when the clients story tell versus like, maybe I ask you about your emotion and you go off on this tangent and you're down this rabbit hole and I'm just like, whoa, how did we get from here to there? And I'm trying to sort through this story to figure out what, what on earth are you talking about? What does that have to do with what I just asked you, <laughs> you know? Yes, that happens a lot when clients do that. And this is where like us, our gentle but persistent focus becomes really important. Right. So if you ask a question and then the client, as soon as you notice the clients out here, I would interrupt gently, like say, Oh, wait, 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 can, can you come back here? Because I, I think I missed it when I asked you, da, 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 da. can we go back to that? Cause I, I feel like I didn't quite understand what you were saying. So as soon as you notice them deviate, you have to give yourself permission to gently interrupt. And I have to say that, Ours, our, us, the therapist, the self of the therapist shows up in the room at this moment because I'm from New Jersey. I'm 100% Italian. I have no problem interrupting and talking over people, but I also am very gentle and soft with it. And I, I will say that some people struggle with that. And it's not to say that you can't do amazing EFT. You can, but also know you, how you bring yourself into the room. Like, are you going to be comfortable with that? And if not, well, how, how to help you feel comfortable is when you notice your client went this way and you didn't go this way, what's going to work best for you to try to pull them back? Yeah, I think that's brilliant. I love how you say that self the therapist comes up in this way. And I've noticed this a lot, you know, I'm, I hear colleagues or some of my supervisees say, but I get so afraid to interrupt them. I don't want them to feel like I'm not hearing them. But again, when we reflect and validate, that's where the feeling heard comes into play, right? But we're trying, especially because it's not like our sessions can take all day. And if we let them go off on these tangents, you know, we're going to lose a lot of time that we could be organizing. So I love you had the brilliant response that said, I think I missed it, right? So that says like, I'm paying attention to you. I'm trying to hear you, but I don't think I got it. Can we go back to this place? And you gently try to bring them back and realizing that interrupting them. And, and I do hear some trainers say that that's part of their explanation of the kind of the working agreement with them and the clients is I need to be able to interrupt you sometimes, right? So if therapists get kind of scared about interrupting their clients, thinking it's going to scare off the clients, it's, it's not necessarily. It's find your 
niche the, the way that you feel comfortable doing it but don't be afraid to do it because you can't let them reel all the way out because it's going to be a lot harder to come back in right and the, and the reframe around interrupting being rude like i feel like we need to look at it it's not rude because the more we interrupt and direct the session in the where it needs to go the more focused we are the more progress that's made in that session so if people can hold that as it's like you know you have you have you have the answers for relationship success if you believe in the eft model you know what it takes they don't no one gave it to them and you're just trying to guide them in a way so they can learn how to be successful and feel loved and feel cared for and realize how they get stuck they don't have that information you do so if you let them talk about content you're not going to be able to give them that information and give them the experiences they need to have to shift that's beautiful. As you said that, I kind of had this metaphor come up in my head as Sue always talks about it being a dance. And I'm thinking of, you know, if you've ever taken a dance class and you're going over the steps with the teacher and your dance teacher has you start, you know, trying to do the steps. But if you start getting out of the dance or, or stepping out of place, they're stopping the music and they're saying, wait a second, wait a second, let's stop right here. And then we're going over the steps that you missed and then we're gonna go back and try it again. So it's the same thing. And we don't get upset when our dance instructor interrupts us and says, nope, nope, we, we gotta fix this right here. And that's essentially what we're doing. Yeah, that's right. And I think that when you, lots of us all the time get lost in EFT sessions. I think that's just part of part of being an EFT therapist. Like you might be like, wait, where are we? What just happened? And I feel like we need to give ourselves permission to say, hang on a second. I got lost here. I need to go back. So like when the dance moves, like you're saying, aren't, you're not doing them the right way. And your dance instructor is interrupting you to help show you something. We as therapists just, just own it ourselves. Like I'm kind of lost. I need to go back here. And that then I feel unlost because if I stay in a place of feeling lost and being like, where's my entry point here? And I'm just kind of overwhelmed. I'm not going to, I'm not going to interrupt. I'm going to be listening for something new and that could take a long time. And I don't want to do that. So I got to go back to the place that I last was feeling like we were creating movement where we were starting to unpack some emotional experience. Like that's where I'm going to go when, when they start going, Ooh. So would you go back to the last thing you remember you that you, you know, maybe you asked them what emotions come up for you in this place and they started to go off another tangent. Is that the place where you would go back to? Yes, I would definitely go back there. I think what I, what I like to do is find the key phrase for each client that works for them, the attachment key phrase. And the clients are going to give you so much about who they are and who their partner is, blah, blah, blah. And our job is to take all that information and funnel it down to a key phrase that works for that person. And the key phrase could be something about, it could be something about wanting to matter in this relationship, loving your partner more than anything and just wanting to matter. That could be a key phrase for a pursuer, something very, very simple, but everything that they say funnels down to that or Everything they says, they everything they say funnels down to, I feel so alone in this relationship. All I want is to be close to you. And all these things that happen to us, I keep feeling alone. That's their key phrase. So once we find the key phrase that works and we are in attunement with our client with that, that to me is if once I figured that out, I and it could be an image too, anything that moves someone into their emotional experience and focuses them. I highly recommend that you use that phrase over and over and over and over again. I say, like, I, like to keep away from content, you have to be focused. And what I, when I talk to people about repeating these key phrases, and sometimes, you know, um, trainees will say, well, what happens when your client says, why do you keep repeating that? My answer to that is, if clients, if you're using that key phrase effectively, they're moving into their emotional experience. And once they move into their emotional experience, they're no longer thinking and keeping track of how many times you're saying the same phrase. Mm -hmm. I have a session that I show in Core Skills all the time, and it's like a, 
it, I, I'm trying to think about the minutes it is. It might be 13 to 15 minutes. And I think it's 20 times I say alone on an island. And that's a short amount of time to say that. And the guy has no clue that I keep saying that over and over again. One time I think I counted 27 and I don't know what the time limit was, but because he gave me that image and it plugs him into his experience and he was trying to drop content in, right? Which is what clients do. So we use our key phrase or the key image and we hand it back. And then we hand it back and we ask them to focus on that. And we say, wait, let's come back to this place where you're alone on an island. So it's like you keep organizing whatever they're getting, giving you back into this attachment phrase or this attachment image. Like they may try to give you more, but you're relating it back to almost like an anchor point. And you're anchoring it into an attachment theme that fits for them. That is, that's exactly right. And I think uh, and you can call it an anchor. We could say you put a stake in the ground and that's where you always come back to. You can imagine a funnel, right? Where we, we're pouring like a bunch of water and it's funneling down to something. Real. Whatever image works for you to think about as an EFT therapist, this is important. And this will help me move away from content. Not, not disregard it, not dismiss it so your clients feel dismissed, but you take it and you funnel it down to the most significant thing. And the reason why EFT works is because it is what matters. The model, attachment, connection, it's what matters. It's at the heart of all of us as human beings. So you're like, you're going to be right. If you keep funneling it down, right? As we're, we're, we're right because we're going to hit the client where it's most important. And that's where they need the most help. So when you realize that your client is kind of tracking how many times you say something, it sounds like you're saying that's a good indication that they're not in their body. They're not really connecting to the attachment phrase. They're not in the emotions. So how do you, how would you respond in that moment when you make that connection that, oh, they're in their head, they're caught thinking and tracking how many times I'm saying something rather than really buying in? Well, the first thing I would say is don't panic. If your client says to you, why do you keep repeating that? I do feel like that can be a, oh no moment, like, cause you're called out on something and then you feel like you're doing EFT wrong. So the first thing I would say is just take a deep breath. It's totally okay. Cause EFT is so forgiving and your clients are so forgiving. If you have a good alliance and you're repeating something and they call it out, they still like you. So try not to panic. Um, I would say to that, I haven't had that happen. I, ha I haven't had somebody say, why do you keep repeating that? So, but I have heard people talk to me about that. So the thing that I would think about for the therapist is, are you in attunement with your client when you're repeating? Because it's not just about repeating. It's about feeling emotionally with them. Like, you have to feel what they're feeling and they have to be alongside of you. You have to be alongside of them. So if your client's not feeling, our job is if we think about a staircase, we want to gently walk them down the staircase into the emotions. So if they're here and we're using our key phrases and we're using a soft voice and we're pausing and we're using attachment language, but this relationship is so important that helps them move a step down. If, we, if, we're, if we're conversational at all in our tone, I think like this like kind of how we're talking right now, I feel like clients were appealing to the cognitive part of their brain and understanding something. So it really, you know, if you think about the very, very simple thing that we teach in EFT, which is risk, repeat images, soft, slow, simple, and client's words. If we're trying to move someone into their emotional experience, risk, using risk is really important. You don't have to be mushy gushy. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, but you have to find a way to slow down, to add pauses in your voice so clients have the time to feel. That takes time. Right. So it sounds like maybe once you hit on that the client isn't in the feeling part that they're stuck in their head maybe we can meet them back in that place and kind of what comes up for you as you hear me say this over and over i notice you're noticing me so what's going on for you just sort of like that check-in that can help us reground and bring them back into the emotion 
Yeah, I would say exactly. When we realize that we're not in attunement or our clients commenting about us repeating, then we realize that we're not in attunement because they're not emotionally feeling. We do have to go back up. So if you're on the staircase and you're three steps down and your client's at the top step, you have to go up there with them. So going up there with them is like, oh yeah, I was kind of repeating. Again, agree with the client. Agree with our clients. You were repeating, right? So we go, yes, I was doing that. I'm really sorry about that. I just feel like there's this piece that's like super important. So tell me what's happening for you right now as you hear me repeating it, just like you said. But you do go up to that top step with them and you meet them where where they're at in their head and then we try again and we try to implement risk again and we try to move them slowly and as much as we want our clients to go from like the top step to the bottom step they don't do that it's a process you know right. it's like if you think about when we go through the tango if you watch like a really good eft session that has like let's just say there's four tangos what you would notice is each time you're in the accessing emotion for the for person a it goes like a rung deeper and then the next time a rung deeper and then it, so it's so that's kind of like the walking down the staircase of emotional experience that our clients need to feel and we need to go with them and i love that and i want to so there's two ways i want to go with this so we'll, we'll come back to one i think one of the things too is that when clients are really super cognitive and they they just seem to not be wanting to go into the emotion, even though they're saying, I get it, I get it, I get it. So like now let's hurry up and go through the process. But, you know, before we go to that, I want to go back to connect this back to the storytelling about meeting them in their head. And I think a lot of EFT therapists keep thinking it's antithetical to EFT to, you know, go cognitive, but really it's not antithetical to EFT because we're trying to meet them where they're at and join with them so that we can, you know, get access to opening up those other compartments that they're compartmentalizing. And sometimes I might even say when they start to storytell, because I'll try to interrupt them. It doesn't happen very often, but I've had a few clients who were just so big on this. So, but wait, wait, I promise I'm going to get to the point. I'm going to get to the point. And at the very end, I still didn't get it. And I'm like, okay, I'm kind of confused when I asked you about your emotion and you kind of told me this story. I'm not quite sure I got a strong sense of the feeling you had there. Can you help me? And I think some of the clients just aren't used to organizing their thoughts into clear, concise points about how they feel. And I noticed like a lot of times when I check in on the storytelling thing, like I, I didn't get clear. I just kind of heard the story, but I'm still not quite sure. Spouses are over there shaking their head like, yeah, this is what happens at home. I get lost too in all of these details. And all those details can feel so overwhelming. And I think the storyteller is just trying to convey a point and they just don't know how to say it without giving you gobs of details. Yes, that the, maybe they're trying to convey something. I would look at that as how they're protecting themselves. There's something that's vulnerable in what you've asked them or whatever, wherever you are in the session and being really verbal and giving lots of words and details. I see that as a form of protection. So it's, and especially when you just said about the spouse being like, yep, I'm with you. I didn't get it either. And I get all these words because like they're saying like, these are moments where the protection's up and we are kind of on separate planets. Like the spouse has no idea what's going on. You ask the question and all this stuff and all these words, that's what probably happens in their cycle. So we need to find a way to be able to reflect, like I hear you, like I hear you and you're giving me so many words and so many details. And like, I wonder if you just slow down and pause and take a deep breath, like, what's happening inside or how do you feel about this or something where we can conjecture if we've tried a couple times to ask them the question and they keep going off. Right. I, I usually have my general rule of thumb is ask the client the question a few times, like three or three times or maybe four and then conjecture. That's, that's how I do it. People, a lot of people will just conjecture sooner, but I like to ask the client a couple times first. Um, but we might need to conjecture that when you get really, verbal and start telling me lots of details i get this sense that there's something hard going on for you like or or painful or 
maybe even a little bit, I don't know, scary or something to talk about how you feel in those moments when your spouse disappears. And I like that sort of how you stay anchored in that because that's some of the problem with storytelling when I was early in my EFT days is the clients would go so elaborately into these stories, I would totally lose focus and forget what it is that I even asked them. And now I'm lost in that content with them. So remembering maybe if it's on your pad of paper or, you know, what was the cue or the question that you asked them right before they told the story. So then you can come back and kind of connect it. Oh, so if you can organize it, you can route it back to, so when you're feeling alone or your spouse disappears or, you know, you're not feeling heard, this is sort of what happens, you know, just bringing it back and staying anchored in the original cue or the original thing you were asking them for. We're trying to work on that signaled them to go into the story mode. And then the other way I think we get stuck, um, you know, pivoting back to the other thing is when clients are so super cognitive and they are like, you know, I have engineers, I have doctors, lawyers, and these are like extraordinarily intelligent people. And their logic is so good that it feels like they just played a head game with you. And you're like, what what just happened here but their logic is so good you know and it, it can be so hard to to keep your balance at least i've struggled to keep my balance sometimes when i feel kind of outwitted by the client and i know like some part of me recognizes okay they're moving away from the emotion i'm asking them about emotion and they keep going away and giving me you know cognitions or they're trying to tell me all these reasons why it's not feeling okay but they're so witty about it you don't even realize that's what's happening in the moment so how do you you know or they'll say like i get it i get it but you know but they're not slowing down into the process and they're like okay i i got it mentally that's enough let's go let's not sit here in this emotion and repeat this five times you know how do you kind of get your balance or gain that entry point in those situations I think sometimes with the really logical, cognitive, highly intellectualized client, um, we, we need to validate that part of themselves. So, like, if we see it as uh, something that's really difficult or we're frustrated with it, I do feel it makes it harder for us to be with them. If we hold the, hold the piece that says, oh, this intellectualizing, rationalizing, high education is the way that you have learned to prove yourself in a world that has been unkind to you. So if we can hold that while we're talking to somebody like that, it's like, I think it's easier for us to sit with them and, and, just, and, and, and sort of let it be okay. Let it be okay that they do that and then reflect that they do that. You know, like, like we don't want to let them off the hook because we understand it through that attachment lens, but we want to be able to say, well, of course you're going to do it that way. And your whole life you've been rewarded for being logical or being, you know, really smart or get, you know, going through med school. Like if you were in your heart the whole time in med school, you would have failed. You wouldn't be successful right now. So you've been, your whole life you've spent in this in this way of being and it makes sense and here i am asking you a question that sounds like i'm asking you something in chinese and so i get it i get that this is how you've been for your whole life and what i'm asking you sounds like you would have no idea what i'm talking about and that's okay let's figure this out together so something like that to validate and support the way that they are in the world and also recognize that sometimes we're asking people the questions that really does sound like Chinese, like what's happening for you right now? I've had clients be like, I have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Cause there's such a disconnect that they don't even realize like that I'm trying to look for some kind of churning inside. Right. Cause there's just nothing. They spent their whole life cut off from that. Right. Like the water faucet has been turned off. There's not even a drip in the pipe. So when you notice that, what do you do when they are like, I have no idea. Like I feel nothing. Like they'll say, I feel nothing, but when you kind of have like a nothing or I don't have any words kind of nothing, they're like, no, I'm not numb, but I don't, it's not that I don't have the words, I just don't feel anything. 
that can be really hard. It feels like a big brick wall up against you, and it's like, oh, what do I do with that? <laughs> Yeah, it is. It, it is a big brick wall. Um, and it's, again, I'm going to say it's because they don't know how to speak Chinese and we're asking them to do that. So what we do with that is um, be very, 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 very patient. I have a client right now who has a significant trauma history. And of course, he's a clinical psychologist. He's a, I see, we'll see them as a couple. Um, so, you know, very smart, high educated, trauma history. I just asked him in session, like when we were talking about his sense of failure and shame that he has inside. And like, if he can feel any of that in his body right now, and he's like, nope. And I'm like, nothing. And he's like, nope. And so what I did, right, because that's the wall. Like, I mean, first of all, I was like blown away because usually when I ask that question and I've circled around several times like feeling like a failure or not measuring up in your wife's eyes when you love her so much usually there's something happening in the body so i was like shit um <laughs> so i you know i just i would i circled back around to it because and what i noticed is that as i was asking him this question he kept going to his head and 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 being cognitive so that's what i need to reflect so here I am asking you about your body, asking you to dip your toe in this water, this feeling of feeling like a failure in your wife's eyes, and you keep kind of distracting yourself with words. I'm wondering if you can notice that right now, like that there's this part of you that's kicking in gear right now that's saying, change the subject, talk about something else, get, stay cognitive. Can you notice that part of you right now? So like, just just seeing right if i'm fo if i'm focused and i keep circling around and i'm asking him this question and they do answer like i don't know i don't feel anything and then they go blah, 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 then point that out because you're you're wanting to invite them into the experience and i will invite people i'll say can you please pause with me here take a deep breath can you allow yourself to dip your toe in the water and feel what it feels like to feel like a failure in your wife's eyes can you do that can we pause for a second and can you let yourself feel that right now what it feels like to be a failure in your wife's eyes so that's what i would do so again i'm sort of dropping them down the steps i'm inviting them i'm repeating i'm using my risk voice i love that that's really good I'm just imagining my clients you know i have, I have a particular client where it is you know nothing but when I say is it like you're numb like no I'm not numb well maybe is it you don't have words for what you're feeling no I could come up with the words right no how dare you insult my intelligence of course I have the words I'm just not feeling anything right because they're they're kind of what I hear is they're saying there's nothing to feel and and I so you're saying kind of run that cue by almost like a so when your wife says that she sees you as a failure you're feeling like a failure in her eyes you feel nothing on the inside could we pause there and just could you allow yourself to stay and could we you know i love how you said inviting him into into feeling right inviting the client into feeling could we just stay and feel what it feels like that's incredible i didn't think to do that before <laughs> you know that's good. I'm glad. And it's like what you're saying to your client is, can we just sit with it for a moment and take a deep breath, right? Because the person probably isn't feeling anything. They're not trying to be difficult. But like when I'm talking about having to add pauses when we talk and using risk, like the reason we do that is because it takes time for clients' emotions to bubble up. Even though we know they're always there and we're emotional beings and that's the first thing that happens to us and we respond from that place and all that stuff that we know, all that's true, but for clients to actually start to plug into that, they need time for it to sort of percolate inside and our soft voice, using pauses, asking them to sit with it for a moment, come back to this place where you feel like you failed your wife and you look in her eyes and you've disappointed her once again and you love her more than anything, you want her to see you as good. 
Can we pause in that place for a second and just sit here? I really like, love that. And I love how you use it. Um, I started using this metaphor with my clients. I asked them, you know, do you drink tea? And most of them say yes. And I say, well, what happens when you put your tea bag in the water and you just rip it out really fast? And they're like, yeah, you, you get like, just barely tainted water, right? That's right. You want to leave that tea bag in there so it percolates and it opens up all these bold, rich flavors. So we really just want to sit in that emotion, even if it's a good emotion, because sometimes they'll say, oh, this feels good. And then it's like, we're moving away again. So I'm like, can we stay right here? And I'm just kind of letting that, letting it steep you know, like a good cup of tea. So you get those bold, rich flavors that we can really enjoy and really latch on to. So I love that you use that word percolate. Yeah, and that's such a great image. I love that tea image because people can get that. You know, that makes sense and I love that. So anything that we could use to help our clients, like some clients, like, like some clients need to understand and that tea analogy helps them understand what you're doing and they need that before they're going to give you anything and usually it's withdrawers who need to have the cognitive understanding and feel validated and supported in that place first before they let you anywhere near their emotion and then we have the other side where if you try to explain and cognitively appeal to like a pursuer who's in emotional distress they'll be mad at you so all they want is for you to hold that space for them to feel, to support them, to be soft with them, right? So it's like, here we are in session with two different types of people, and we need to, as we're talking to this person, we need to kind of make sure we're supporting the understanding piece and, and validating them for that. And then when we turn over here, we're working with our pursuers who are emotional distress, we're softer, and we're more appealing to that and holding them emotionally. And that, that's a lot to do as a therapist, but it's what we do. Right. And I hear, you know, what comes to my mind is just that self of the therapist piece where the therapists kind of come up and, and they start to kind of get confused with the models like, oh, we're supposed to hurry up and get to the emotion. And we skip that some clients, you have to meet them in their head that you're not going to be able to get access to their emotions unless you can join with them. But when we just try to push past that and get into the emotions a we're not really attuning to them and where they're at but we're kind of leaving them behind and therapy can't advance if we're not all together yeah that's super duper important and i think you're right i think a lot of people hear about eft read about eft go to some eft trainings and walk away thinking they got to get their clients in their deep emotion and then they're going to send over enactments and it's like you, 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 there's reasons why we don't go fast in EFT, <laughs> right? And when we, and when so, a client uncovers something new, I feel like some people might just keep going into deepening that emotion. But when a client under, un, uh, uncovers something new, send over the enactment. It's new, right? It's like, and, and work with that, work with how that feels for them to share something with their, with their partner that is something that they just kind of realized about themselves, right? How is that? Because it's kind of vulnerable when you learn something about yourself, right? And that in itself is like, oh my God. That's right. And I think the more, you know, you said this, before, the client is committed to the content or is super cognitive, it's just kind of indicative of their protective strategies and you know we don't want to pry people's defenses away from them as we see in EFT we want to hand them to them because the goal is we want them to feel safe enough to put it down so if we can meet them there you know and they're behind their cognitive shield and we can relate to them and build that alliance and help them know it's safe then they're going to be able to start putting their own shield down and saying okay I, I need to get into this and they're really not used to exploring emotion in this way or thinking about themselves in this way. So of course they're going to want to go back to content because that's their way of orienting themselves in the world. And it can feel super frustrating because we're like, let's hurry up and get to the emotion. Let's hurry up and get to the emotion. And you know, we always say slow is fast in EFT because when you go too fast, you skip over things 
and you don't get to see, you know, when you slow it down and stretch it open, there's really big things that come out that are important that you wouldn't have gotten if you were moving too fast. So when you go slow and these new things, like you said, they learn these new things about themselves through this process, those things emotionally end up being really profound and are part of the changes that happen. Yeah, that's right. That's it's you know the the go slow in EFT. The faster you get results is so so very true, and people like to rush, and they like to move people away from where the client is. And I, I think that you know one of the things that I've sort of been noticing recently with my own work is that. When I'm with a client, I feel like what I do with them is I just be with them and validate them. And I'm not trying to move them somewhere. But the more attuned I am with them, the more I'm validating, the more I'm with them, the more they move, right? And, and I think like that's a, that's a hard skill to learn, to be able to just be with your client and not try to move them. Because I think people go into EFT sessions thinking they have to make something happen so what the therapist does is they try to move the client instead of just sitting and being with the client. So the more you try to move the client, the more the client stays stuck. And the more like you put this pressure the on to be like a magician. I love how you said like we put this pressure on to make something happen. Like we're inviting our clients to a magic show. Watch us pull the white rabbit out of the hat. <laughs> and that doesn't always happen, you know. And sometimes it's that attuning to them, just deeply being with them, that is the white rabbit out of the hat percent. right because that's how they uncover things about themselves and then they move rather than it be like a tug of war right between you're trying to pull them this way and they're going no i'm not going that way because you're not with me and it's too scary so i'm not going that way but i need you to come over here because this is really important this is eft but no no you're way too scary and you're too emotional and i'm gonna leave you and stay here right so that's what kind of happens in sessions yeah oh man that's so good so rich this is why we love you so much. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things that popped into my head, sorry, like, um, is the, what I mentioned earlier, and I want to come back to it because I feel like it's so important, especially with the people who are in content and stuff. First of all, our alliance goes a long way. And the, but this important piece is when we start talking that we say yes and or something that conveys that, if you listen to EFT sessions um, or even your own sessions and you notice that when your client finishes talking, if you say, but, because you were trying to show them something, it doesn't feel right. Um, so there's, but if you say, if they're talking and you go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you add something, it, there's a flow and you stay in alliance and attunement with your client. So when they're contenting away, it's very important for us to agree with them, yes, and then make sense out of that. Let it, let, it, let it be okay that they're doing that, that we see them in that place. And that place makes sense because that's how they've been their whole life, right? So I'm just, I just feel like that's such an important thing in getting clients to move into their emotional experience. Validate, agree with them, don't use the word but in an EFT session, Notice what happens if you do. Like that's a general, general thing. Like I'm sure people can use it sometimes, but I find that when I'm watching sessions, I try to tell people don't use the word but. Let's just try to get that out of our vocabulary. Right. I love that because we know this, but like if you're trying to land something with the client and they do the yes, but we know that that's not fully landing. So if they're trying to give us something and we say yes, but, it feels like a diversion away from the thing they were trying to hand us. That's right, which is why that word is like a word that like, I work really hard to keep it out of my vocabulary. And sometimes like even today, I noticed I said it several times as we've been talking and I'm like, why are you using that word, Debbie, in the back of my head? Because I don't like that word because it discounts. It discounts the first thing. And I feel like there's nothing that we've been talking about today that I want to discount. <laughs> so. Well, it's cool that you noticed that. I didn't even notice. And I didn't feel discounted. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I think I said it when I was talking. I think I would say something, and then I would butt myself. <laughs> so we start paying attention to the butts. No, no butts. <laughs> <laughs> That's right.
No butts in EFT. That would be a funny t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> we'll start selling those. We'll see. Look for our booth at the next 2020 summit or whenever the summit's going to be. <laughs> yes, that would be fun. I love that, Debbie. So, you know, just to highlight, you know, some of the main points is I love this idea of agreeing with the client as part of that validation and reflection, meeting them where they're at, building that rapport, that alliance with them. You know, they're not wrong for the way that they feel. So the, we don't want to give them that impression that they're wrong. We want to agree with them. Yeah, this is what's going on with them. And when they get super cognitive, realize that's their defenses or Maybe they just really don't know how to do it. So kind of explore which one is it for them and just meet them where they're at. And again, validate, 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 you know, and remember keeping yourself grounded by remembering the thing that you were after right before they went super cognitive or went into story mode. That that's the biggest thing for me was how to help, you know, the therapist stay anchored in those moments without getting caught in that rabbit hole with them is remembering what was the thing you asked them right before they went into that rabbit hole. So then you can come back and sometimes even if you absolutely need to say, okay, I'm not quite sure how that's related to this thing that I asked. Can you help me? Cause I got confused, <laughs> right? Again, being really explicit about the process, which is really awesome. So uh, Debbie, you are just amazing. You are so amazing. This is why we love having you on here now. You know, you are, offer trainings you're working on some training videos where can people find you what what if they want to fam save you where can they find and follow you <laughs> oh my gosh see you're talking about social media which is like my biggest weakness which is why people can't follow me oh. they don't know who i am no, just kidding <laughs> i wish i was on social media it's on my to-do list so that'll happen at some point um but what's, what's that or your website or yeah, iSEP. Yeah. Where, where can we go? Well, my, yes, my website is um, easily accessible via email or my website, which is CouplesTherapyNJ.com because I'm in New Jersey. Um, and uh, I, I, I can be reached via email also, which is DSDS at CouplesTherapyNJ.com. I hope to have training tapes available on my website. Um, my, you know, my hope was to do them probably eight months ago and I re decided to revamp my whole website. So that was been in the works. And now that that seems to almost be done, I'm going to move to this next phase and you know, you got to rely on other people like the people who are the website designers to, to do their job. So hopefully that will be out soon. Um, I do. I also do short term online supervision groups, which I think are kind of cool because it's only six months. And so you could get a, a um, kind of keep yourself immersed in EFT in a group with with you know with a trainer who's just kind of redirecting, helping guide you. I feel like when we watch anyone's tapes, we always all learn. Um, usually in my six month series, I'll show a tape of mine at some point, and um, people like to watch that also and learn and see the interventions that I'm doing. Um, so that's pretty much where I'm at these so days. How, how do they sign up for the supervision group? Um, just email me because I have I have a bunch of them starting. Obviously, it's fall, so that I usually start in September and I run for six months, and then I'll have a next series. So right now, I have three starting this month. Um, so if people are interested in working with me in a supervision group, they should email me. Excellent, and I'll make sure that we put the link to your to your email in the description for this video on YouTube. And guys, of course, you know the trainers. They can fly, they can come to your area. So if you're interested in having Debbie come to your area and teach a master class, definitely hit her up. You know, you know, if you guys can work out the schedule, it's great to have the trainers out. Yes, thank you. And I will say that if you are in, I tend to work in Oklahoma and Michigan um, and St. Louis and New Jersey. So if you're in that area, reach out to me and I could tell you what's going on in those areas because um, they're fun. The pe and the people in every area are just amazing people. So if you're in that area and you're watching this tape, then reach out to me because I would love to connect you with the communities in those areas too because they're all starting to grow and it's just awesome to be a part of and witness that. That's excellent. Yeah, a lot of folks will find their way to EFT and then they 
connected to the community there. So chances are there could be a community in your area. So make sure that you reach out to the trainer and find out, you know, is there a local community you can get connected to and Debbie will definitely help you with that. I'm excited about your supervision group. So I may hit you up for that because I love supervision. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Can I leave you guys with an image that uh, that one of my trainees had said to me once, which I thought was great about this whole content thing. She said, Oh my god, I need like EFT earmuffs when all the content just goes by because she would reflect content all the time. And I just have this image that we that's another thing we need to create is EFT earmuffs so that we don't we realize that that can just flow by us. We don't need to grab that. Our job is to grab the process and reflect what we see in front of us. Not all that content story, not getting caught in those rabbit holes. So try to put on your EFT earmuffs. Give yourself compassion as you do EFT. It's a really, really important thing. And give yourself permission to take a breath in a session, just like you want your clients to do when you need them to slow down. We need to slow down too. Yeah, yeah. and it's not awkward. Good. It's okay to say take a break can we just take a breath here for a moment and pause and hang out here for a second don't be afraid to do that debbie thank you so much you are just so fabulous and guys just make sure that you find the links to her videos and to her email in the description for this video and oh we heart therapy is soon to be a podcast i'll be posting the link soon so you know, you can stream this on YouTube in your car as you drive. You can plug it into your auxiliary and just run it like a podcast. But if you want to download it and watch it or listen to it in offline mode, will soon be a podcast as well. So coming soon to you. So thank you again, guys, for staying tuned. Make sure that you catch some of the other videos that Debbie and I have done. They are also fabulous. And thank you for watching our channel. And make sure that you hit subscribe because there are more wonderful episodes coming soon. Thank you.